Well, I just wanted to uh, point out one, that I do not defend the Palestinians. And in my own personal opinion, and the opinion of most Israelis, when one, when one is uh, dividing up responsibility for uh, who is responsible for the situation uh, that exists now, I have no doubt that the Palestinians and the Arabs in general are much more responsible than Israel is. So that's not, the, the point is not to point out how the Arabs are, either, I don't know, against peace or against them. That, that's a given. But we have to deal with the situation as it is. I do not want Israel to be judged by the standards that Arab countries are judged. I want Israel to be judged by the standards that democratic countries are judged. And even that, I want Israel to be judged by the standards that Israel is worthy of. Um, and so, I, you know, of course, there is an inherent disadvantage to a democratic country versus... Uh, but there's also a lot of advantages to that. I think criticism makes Israel stronger, not weaker. I think the fact that Israel has such a robust society where people say whatever they want makes, has made it into what it is today compared to Arab countries where, you know, if you say something against the government, you get... You get so, so, of course, that has an effect on the media. The media uh, uh, depicts Israel, in my opinion, again, this is not shared by people here, more or less in a balanced way. That's my opinion, and I think statistically um, uh, it, it's also true. Um, and they have to, the media has to, if it, if, in order to be balanced, and I'm talking both Israel and American media, they have to point out the bad as well as the good. Imagine you read a newspaper in, I don't know, France, a pro, a conservative newspaper, and it would say, yes, uh, the United States is taking a very, under Trump, is taking a very strong position versus North Korea. The economy is booming. Um, I don't know, probably there's some other good thing to say. And that would be it. And that would be your picture of what is the situation in America today. Would that be a valid picture? No. It would not be a balanced picture. It would not be an informative picture. So yes, and I get back to this, the Palestinians have repeatedly rejected peace proposal after peace proposal, and no one is claiming that they want peace. But if you live in Israel, if you look at the actions the government is taking, if you look at the statements that, is, that Benjamin Netanyahu makes, a lot of them uh, do not get reported in the Los Angeles Times, and I'm talking about statements that would make him look bad, not good, <laughs> then you know that, there, that, the United, that the Israeli government might want peace, but only in very theoretical terms. Now that doesn't mean that it is responsible for the lack of peace. It just means that it would rather have the status quo as it exists today, where the uh, security situation is great, relatively speaking. The economic situation is great. The diplomatic situation is great. Why should it start to, 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 to deal with the Palestinian question that could blow the whole thing up? So it wants the status quo, and it prefers the status quo to peace. That's not a political statement. That's, right. an, that's not an objective, because there is no such thing. But that's a realistic assessment of the situation. So let's see, um, one of the, because what you're talking about, and then I'll punt it over to Larry, what you're talking about is when you said that you can, you can show only little parts of the realities out there and give a very false impression. And I understand that. And that's why the example I gave in North Korea, it could, it could say, well, we have people who are living, I, I suppose, <laughs> in North Korea. I know that Cuba, for example, <clears throat> Uh, brags that it has 98% literacy. Well, okay, that doesn't make Cuba a good country, right? So, more to your point. Uh, one of the problems, though, I, I would have, uh, and maybe ask Larry to address, is the, the falsifying of information um, in, in the Palestinian territories and otherwise, where they claim, for example, that uh, Israelis are butchering little Arab children, and doing the horrific things that they do. Larry talked about the apartheid claim and such. <laughs> um, so I, I got a feeling that Henry wants to speak about this. Um, so, so what do we do with that? I mean, we're dealing in a democracy. There is this balance where truth eventually comes out. Uh, you can try to push it a little, but somebody will push back. Not so in the Palestinian territories. It's a free for all. What do you have to say about that? Where do I start? Um, 
you have Jimmy Carter and I mentioned John Kerry, both of whom, if they were here, would tell you that they believe that the Palestinians are more desirous of peace than are the Israelis. They would both tell you that. How is it that international polls, when pollsters go around the world and ask various countries to name the country that is the most threatening to peace? You know the countries that are named routinely? North Korea, Israel, United States. WTF. <laughs> what is that? Other than massive, massive ignorance and indoctrination. This is where we are. Most people in this country are unaware of the three no's. No peace, no recognition, no negotiation. Most people are unaware that in 1948 when the British soldiers left, Israel was invaded, not by one, not by two, not by three, not by four, but by five countries at the same time. And isn't it amazing that you start a war, you lose it, you lose territory, you start another war, you lose it, you lose territory, and you're the one who's demanding that the land be returned? What is that? I mean, the idea that the media are fair to Israel, uh, to me, is just absurd on its face. Uh, people would not have the same attitude about the state of Israel that they have. The BDS movement would not have taken hold the way it has. You wouldn't have hundreds of professors signing the petition that I mentioned before if they really understood what was going on there. Uh, the idea that the bad guys uh, are Israelis and the good guys are Palestinians, suddenly the Palestinians are David uh, and the Israelis are Goliath. A country of seven million people surrounded by 300 million people of varying levels of hostility and you guys, the Israelis, are perceived to be the Goliath? This is insane. Yeah. Uh, now I, now, I, now I'll add a, something. All right. First of all, the majority of people in the United States do not think Israel is the aggressor, do not think that the Palestinians are uh, uh, the good side. There are polls about that. The Palest you know, there's this question that Pew asks every year. And so the numbers of who are, who are you more sympathetic towards, Israel or the Palestinians? The numbers fluctuate. But the last poll, 52% were in favor of Israel, 16% were in favor of the, Pal or sympathized more with the Palestinians, and the rest of various degrees don't know. The American public opinion supports Israel. And if American public opinion supports Israel, you cannot disconnect the years of media coverage of Israel from that just because you don't like the, the media coverage. Um, I mean, 52% is too low. It's way too low. How can only 52% of people believe that Israel uh, is right in the situation? Uh, I think Golda Meir probably summarized it as well as anybody when she said, if the Israelis laid down their arms, there would be wholesale slaughter. If the Palestinians laid down their arms, there would have been peace. And we're gonna have this problem as long as Palestinian mothers hate Israelis more than they love their own children. This is the situation that we have right now. I, I, have, I don't think as an Israeli, I'm not dealing from morning till night who is right and who is wrong. I'm telling you in advance, Israel is right and everybody else is wrong. Let's put that aside. But we have to find a solution. It, I'm not, I don't support territorial concessions in the West Bank or in Judea and Samaria because the Palestinians are demanding it or because it's their right. I don't recognize their right, and I don't care if they're demanding it. I support land concessions and the establishment of a Palestinian state because, my, in my opinion, the alternative is suicide for Israel. It's not a question of who's right and who's wrong. It doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. There's a practical situation that needs to be solved. Now you're saying the Palestinians are not a partner. That's quite possible, but we still have to try until there is a partner. So, so let me help a little bit. Uh, let me just, let me just say something very quickly. That. I don't disagree, Hemi, with what you said about what we have to do. The issue I thought today was whether or not the media are fair in covering Israel. And the answer is hell no, they're not. Now, as to whether or not this will affect how people feel about Israel, as to whether or not we need to deal with the reality on the ground, that's a separate question. The issue today is, are the media fair to Israel? And my answer is not even close. Let me move on to the, uh, to the next question, which, uh, can you hear me? Is, it, is this on? Okay, great. So the, one of the questions, and I think, Hemi, you brought this up, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we talked about the much greater um, Muslim uh, presence in Europe 
and how that is perhaps changing media perceptions. Do you feel, Hamid, that um, that is uh, helping Israel, the perception of Israel, or hurting the perception of Israel, and why? It works both ways. Okay. There's a lot of antagonism towards um, uh, Muslim immigration in some countries, and that antagonism spills over into uh, uh, support for Israel. Unfortunately, it, uh, that is also true of the extreme right where you, in, in Europe, where you now have this very strange phenomenon of parties that are very pro-Israel, but very anti-Muslim, and in many cases also anti-Jewish. Um, but generally speaking, public opinion is wary of uh, the Muslim immigration. The question of ISIS has changed history altogether and has changed perspectives. And as I said, the European countries have uh, a, a different perspective on what, on, and they view Israel as what we always said, an island of stability, much more than, than they used to, given that they've had this wake-up call from ISIS of what can happen if the area uh, goes out of control. But, of course, there's also an influence on the other way. First of all, politicians. I mean, you know, it's like everywhere else. If there's a region, or if there are regional elections in an area that, in which there are a lot of Muslims, the, the candidate who's going to win is going to be the one who's going to tow the most anti-Israel or pro-Muslim line. And that sort of works its way up. Um, and so I think that in countries that have a very large Muslim population, such as France, maybe Germany to an extent, um, this, this could be a problem uh, uh, in, in, as time goes by. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Could be a problem as time goes by. It already is a problem. You look at the polls of young Muslims in Britain and in, in France and in Germany, substantial numbers are perfectly okay with homicide bombing. It's a huge problem. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, one of the things that I always wonder is, I mean, you, we talked before about appealing to uh, the, po the population that is now in your country. So, I mean, there's a growing Muslim population. There's an ever-decreasing Jewish population. And uh, in the 70s, I believe, with all the terrorism that hit Europe, I think Europe decided to make a, uh, a deal with the Arabs to not be so supportive of Israel. I think that's well known. Is, is that going to continue to play, is that, or is that going to change? I didn't completely. The, the uh, kind of detente that Europe has with uh, the Arabs in terms of the way they view Israel? I think, I think my opinion is that, first of all, I don't know. I mean, it could happen. I, I, I think ISIS, as I said, has changed the equation. Okay. The, the kind of terrorists that Europe had accommodations was were political terrorists, um, like the Palestinian organizations, for example. And the Europeans thought, or were deluded into thinking, that they could reach an accommodation if they give political concessions and the, the, the terrorist groups would refrain from attack. Of course, that doesn't exist with groups like ISIS, who are completely nihilistic, and they, have, they, they don't really want anything. And so I just think that given the kind of uh, terrorists that we're facing today, that's not true, but it could still be true for, you know, for countries such as Iran. There are countries in Europe that do a lot of big business with Iran, and I could see them trading with Iran maybe ratcheting up their criticism of Israel in exchange for economic concessions, yeah. Larry? I, I agree that ISIS and groups like that have uh, opened the nostrils of a lot of people in Europe, and they now recognize that the state of Israel living under siege like that uh, could very well happen here. So it's changed a lot of things. I agree with that. Yeah. I'd like to open it up uh, to the floor for some questions. Uh, obviously, please, respectful questions. Um, Matt. Well, again, um, 80 to 90 percent of people get their primary news source from a left-wing source. It certainly is true that there's a lot more media available right now. Uh, 
but when the uh, executive editor of the New York Times essentially says, this is our niche, and the Washington Post says, this is our niche, what they are saying is our niche uh, are people who are perceived as left-wing people, progressives, or independents. This is what they're all pitching towards. Uh, and, and they have atomized their audience to the point where Fox News has become so dominant only because it's the only major player on television uh, that's conservative. Uh, but you know, over half the country voted for, or close to half the country voted for Donald Trump. So there's a whole lot of people out there that are being underserved or being ill-served by the fact that they're still getting their primary sources from these, from these um, groups. And I believe that ultimately the truth wins. Ultimately people wake up, which is why I believe that Hemi is right when, I, when he says that many of the European countries are reconsidering their, their former antagonism, if not hostility, towards Israel as a result of ISIS uh, and Al-Qaeda. Long answer to your question, the short answer is, if you want to get an alternative source of news, you have to work at it. Most people don't. Most people sit in front of the television set, cut it on, and ABC, CBS, NBC, or, or a local newspaper is thrown to their house. That's primarily how people get their news. And so we are still being, in my opinion, indoctrinated by people on the left. And it's not just the media, it's also uh, academia. You're talking about uh, professors where uh, 30, 40, 50 uh, department of, of poli-sci professors, only one will be a conservative, if that. Uh, and uh, these have all been studied. Overwhelmingly, academia is to the left. Overwhelmingly, academia is far more hostile towards Israel uh, than non-academia. Uh, and this is what we have to deal with. And of course, then we have Hollywood. So there are, there, there are three things that I consider to be the primary indoctrinators of America, Hollywood, academia, and media. And they're all left wing. We have a question from Elise. Actually, what I would like is a clarification. I'm a little confused about the moniker of left news. Um, for me, as an attorney, a fact is a fact. So I'm having difficulty understanding the... Uh -huh. <laughs> Barack, can you repeat the question? I don't understand yeah, the, the, how, oh. how you are... There, how the label of left as Jaime has done for, you know, a Pew study. We know, I, for example, I don't pass anything on any social media until I have personally uh, verified that fact. So okay. uh, let me just repeat the question for those who may not have heard it. Uh, this is from Elise Berkeley. She's our, our chair of the board for JNF, so thank you, of course. And the question was uh, uh, asking Larry specifically about the um, the, the left, the term left, and that it, it may not be a fair uh, characterization, that it may be more appropriate in terms of, because it's fact-finding that you're talking about. Later. Well, I'll give you an example. As I said before, me media bias is not just stating this fact or that fact, it's what they don't state, it's perspective. For example, we just had a rash of shootings, mass shootings, and you read an article about the movement for more gun control because X number of people were killed last year. How often do you read where how many people were saved because of a gun? Almost never, almost never. And it seems to me if you're being fair and you're writing an article about a movement for gun control because quote, too many people are being killed, you need to ask the question, how many lives are saved by the fact that somebody was able to get a firearm? And there are studies that show as many as 1.25 million people every single year use a firearm, and 40% of that number believe that but for the gun, they would have been dead. Now, my point, my point simply is that when you write an article about gun control, write an article about how many people want gun control, write an article about how many mass shootings we had, how many people we've lost, we've, lives we've lost, you're not being fair if you don't talk about how many lives are sold by the, or, or saved by the fact that guns are readily available in America. That's just unfair. That's bias. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Dan. I want to. I want to address that question. Oh, please. Go ahead. Sorry, I thought. America is a free country. And anybody who has enough money can set up a newspaper. And the New York Times and the Washington Post, and this is maybe a little different for the television networks, they don't hide the fact that they're liberal. They don't hide the fact that they have a liberal outlook. They don't hide the fact that in their editorials every day, that they have an opinion about everything under the sun, including the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A newspaper is measured by the amount of energy and, and, uh, and effort that it devotes to making sure that the facts that appear on its, page, on its news pages are accurate. 
And I'm telling you, and I may, uh, Larry might not agree, I'm telling you that these newspapers that we often mention are meticulous about trying to present facts as they are and differentiating that from opinion pieces. Now, of course, that's not a perfect, it, it doesn't work in a perfect world, but they do make the effort. And I can tell you the New York Times makes a tremendous effort. Now, there are right-wing, many right-wing uh, uh, news outlets today in America. I don't agree with this 80, 90 percent, but what, that's not the statistics that I read, but never mind. And I'm telling you, and, and all you have to do is look for an hour at Fox News, they do not devote as much effort to making sure the facts are facts, and the political slant that they give on facts is much more pronounced than you would get in the New York Times or the Washington Post. And one more thing. If you, if you think that American journalism is too liberal and too left, you know, it's a free country. Set up a right-wing newspaper. I don't understand this whole complaint about people who don't even hide the fact that they are liberal. The only question is, are they reporting the facts as they are or are they not? And when you catch them making a mistake or misrepresenting, you should call them out. But, when, but, but just to blanket these very professional organizations with a stamp of being biased, that's a political statement. That's not a statement of fact. Let me, um, Brock, and we're saying, sure, go ahead, Larry. Again, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of how they shade the news, how they color the news. For example, I, su I submit that most people in this room watching CNN, watching MSNBC, and Donald Trump is pounded, incompetent, racist. The, the thing he said about Pocahontas, racist. Uh, he's going to ruin the economy. If you watch NBC, watch MSNBC, watch CNN, you would assume that this man is absolutely a blathering idiot. Are you aware that Donald Trump, are you aware that Donald Trump has higher ratings than the Prime Minister of Canada, than Angela Merkel in Germany, than the head of France? Than the head of UK. And their own people. My point is, it, if you watch C CBS, NBC, ABC, would you hear that Donald Trump is more popular than May? More popular than Trudeau? More, pa more popular than Macron? More popular than Merkel? He is. Substantially so. Yet, perception is that Donald Trump is a blathering, incompetent man. How come we don't perceive May to be incompetent? How come we don't perceive Trudeau to be incompetent? Why don't we perceive Macron to be incompetent? Why don't we perceive Merkel to be incompetent? If incompetence is about his popularity rating, which is what they talk about all the time, Trump has higher ratings than all four of those major leaders. So let, let me just uh, add a point, and, and I want to kind of keep this kind of neutral. <laughs> I know and if you're hearing that for the first time, too much CNN, not enough Larry Elder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, when, when I was uh, much younger, and, and I want to get to uh, uh, Daniel, actually, after this. When I was young, a lot of us uh, may remember the times before cable news. Remember that time? Yeah. Right? And what did you have? You had ABC News, CBS News, and uh, NBC, right? And I think it was on... At 5.30 or so in the afternoons, you would get your news there. It's a half an hour to wrap up the entire world, right? No social media and such. And I know that I speak even for Hemi and, 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 and Larry here when I say, we watch these shows. When it came to a topic about Israel, all of us cringed. Am I right? No. You know? Okay, so I was wrong about Hemi. But I think a lot of us here, liberal or, or conservative, we cringed. Because we knew, because a lot of it was, and not about liberal necessarily, it was just, would, would Israel get a fair shake? And we would yell at the TV and say, but what about when Israel you know, helped all the, the Haitians, for example, or to the tsunami uh, in, in Thailand, and all the great things that Israel does, and all the innovations, and what about the way they treat gays? What about the way they treat women? All these wonderful things. But they, don't, they didn't talk about that. And so, look, Maybe I'm making Kemi's point a little bit here, which is that since then, there has been cable news. There's been many more outlets out there, and there's been more of a balance, hopefully. I don't know. Uh, is it enough? Uh, I don't know. I think Larry would say absolutely not. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. So um, I want to take a, a question from uh, Daniel. Hi. Uh, I'm South African, and I lived through apartheid, and to call 
Israel, an apartheid state, is an obscene denigration of people that suffered yes. under apartheid. Yes. So that's the first point. Yes. But, Femi, you mentioned that, um, the, that Israel gets a balanced uh, view on articles in the New York Times, for example. But isn't that uh, standing in support of a moral equivalency between two groups that are entirely not morally equivalent and the way that they treat others is significantly different? Number one, I, I don't think you're going to find many examples of the mainstream media, the establishment media that we're talking about, often calling uh, Israel apartheid or having an apartheid regime. And I reject it as much as you do. So I, there's no argument. It's, it's a mis... That I was not supporting anybody calling it apartheid. On the, on the contrary, I was differentiating that from criticism of Israel's uh, peace policies. What was your second question? <laughs> Sorry. First of all, it's not balanced. It's 3.5 Israelis for every Palestinian. So it's not balanced. Um, second of all, it depends what you're dealing with. If you're dealing with, say, democracy in Israel versus democracy in the West Bank, it's crazy to have balance on that. If you're talking about efforts to, to uh, who is right and who is wrong on a specific issue of the occupation, I, I, I can understand why a newspaper such as the New York Times would want to have balance. And I'll make a point which also goes to what Barack said. Look, for all of us, for all of us, Israel is like our son or our daughter or our aunt or our uncle. Say that your son or your daughter gets involved in a fight somewhere and somebody beats them up or he beats somebody else up. And the next day you read about it in the newspaper and suddenly they're saying that your son insulted the other guy. Your son is a bully who's been walking around beating people up. You know the truth. He's your son. You wouldn't do anything like that. We cannot differentiate emotionally between, uh, and when I say we, in this case, I mean a lot of American Jews who support Israel, cannot differentiate between criticism that is rational. You don't even have to agree with it, but you have to accept it, and criticism that is not. I can't delineate for you on each and, you know, there's a, there's a thin, there's a line that, that you cross over when you start accusing Israel of apartheid or ethnic cleansing or so on. But until you get to that line, there's a lot of criticism that I consider to be valid and which a lot of you will say, no, that proves that they're anti-Semites or anti-Israel. I don't accept that. Okay. Larry? How many newspapers around the world had covers of Donald Trump as a Nazi? A bunch of them did. This is a man whose daughter has converted to Judaism because she married an Orthodox Jew, has another son who's Jewish. Many of the members of his organization are Jewish. Many members of his team are Jewish. One of his top aides, Steve Miller, is a Jew. And yet, cover stories all over the world showing Donald Trump as Hitler. One more time. It's insane. Yeah. Barack, right. over, Barack, over here. OK. Sir? Uh, uh, Larry, I have a question for you. Uh, some of my best friends are black. Does that mean I'm, not an, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a racist? Some of my best friends are black. Does that mean you are a racist or not a racist? Yes. I suppose you could have good friends who are black and still not like black people as, as a whole. I suppose that's, that's true. And what about Donald Trump and his, and his family? Well, you'd have to look at what Donald Trump has done that would suggest that... May I finish? You're applying the question, but you don't want to hear the answer before you reply? It's bizarre. Uh, you must work for the New York Times, sir. Um, uh, if you can give me the action that Donald Trump has taken that suggests he is anti-Semitic, anti give me the action that Donald Trump has taken that makes him a racist, then we can deal with that. But before, I haven't seen anything like that. I'll be happy to give it to you. I, I'd like uh, to hear it. The Before, false equivalency just, after Charlottesville. That, oh. that, that, that there were bad people on both sides. Is, is, is that what he said? Good people on both sides, sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, what do you think about that? I didn't think anything about it. Oh, that says a lot. Yeah, I guess so. I guess I'm not eternally offended the way some people are. Uh, let's take one last question. I know that at least Larry has to go uh, very soon. So, um, sir. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, Bradley Cook, Managing Director of Career Up Now and proud uh, Root Society member. Uh, 
we engage, my organization engages about 5,000 Jewish college students nationally, and a, an increasing issue that we face is related to intersectionality uh, and Linda Sarsour and Black Lives Matter um, and saying that you can't be a feminist and be a Zionist and these different pieces. Um, I mean, I have my own perspectives, but By the way, are you aware that the Black, Black Lives Matter has taken an official position in favor of the BDS movement? For sure, I know that, but I was wondering if you could share like what your perspectives are so that when I'm educating my thousands of college students that I interact with um, on a regular basis, what just, if I can increase my knowledge and other folks can Well, too. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I was just invited to address the Ohio State football team. I went to Michigan. And I get a call from Coach Urban Meyer, and he asked me to come to, uh, to Columbus to address his players because last month he had a speaker in who was a pro-Black Lives Matter guy, and he riled up the whole team. And I'd like you to come in and give your perspective. I hear you every day uh, on radio here in Columbus. I know you have a different perspective. I'm not going to tell you how I feel, he said, but please come down and talk to my players. So I did. 100 players, most of them are black, and they weren't having it. They didn't want to hear what I had to say. I said 300 people last year were injured by lightning in this country. I don't know how many of them were black men, but let's assume that the percentage of people injured by lightning was equivalent to the percentage of black men in the population. So that's 7%. So 21 black men were injured by lightning last year. 16 unarmed black men were killed by the police. So you are more likely to be injured as a black man by lightning than to be killed as an unarmed black man by the police. What about non-unarmed black people? 250 were killed. Most of those had weapons, guns, knives, or some other weapon, or were perceived to have had a weapon. 500 white people were killed by the police last year. I said, name one. Yeah. Couldn't do it. My perspective is real simple. All these people who were killed, virtually all of them uh, who died, uh, Eric Gardner, Freddie Gray, Michael Brown, Trayvon <laughs> Martin, Sandra Bland, uh, you name it, They'd all be alive if they hadn't resisted. All you have to do is comply and you won't die. My father said, if you're pulled over by the police, put your hand, left hand at two, 10 o'clock, your right hand at 2 o'clock, make sure your paperwork is in order, say yes sir, say no sir, and if something goes wrong, get a badge number and you and I can deal with it while we're both alive. That's what I told him. At 70, the number of blacks killed by the police in the last 45 years, according to the CDC, has declined 75%, while the numbers of whites have pretty much flatlined. You could make an argument that if anybody wants to complain about excessive brutality, it's white males. A black male is, young black man is seven times more likely to be murdered than a young white male. The number one cause of preventable death for young whites are accidents, like car accidents. The number one cause of preventable death for young blacks Homicide, almost always at the hands of another young black man. Of all the people that were killed, less than 4% were a white cop killing an unarmed black man. And being unarmed does not mean not dangerous. Michael Brown was very dangerous. He charged Officer Darren uh, Wilson and Ferguson. His DNA, for crying out loud, was on Officer Darren Wilson's gun. And the grand jury ruled that it was a self-defense issue. So even if you don't have a weapon, it doesn't mean you're not dangerous. The instances of a police person, a policeman or a policewoman killing a black man is extremely rare. And the reason it doesn't, doesn't seem to be rare is because of NBC, CBS, ABC. Have a black guy kill a black guy, nobody gives a rip. White guy kills a black guy, here comes Anderson Cooper. Yeah. Uh, wait, well, I know that we have, have to run. One, one more question. One more question? Okay, great. This is Max Stodel. Is, 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 is that this okay is, with you, Larry? Okay. This is from Max Stodel. He's a Holocaust survivor. So Max, stand up. Good morning. Good morning. I came in this room not knowing what was going on here, but I have been asked ask the question. I'm from the Netherlands. I lost my whole family. I'm one of the few oligarchs family who was still alive. I was in 90 different camps. I walked the death march. Holland stopped paying people for being in the Holocaust. I get paid, there is a story to it, I don't want to bore you with it. I get paid 
since 1973, the Netherlands government and bank uses my social security for a pay premium for. I pay myself social security for the social security, my holder got money. If there is one or two lawyers in the audience who are able and willing to help me, I appreciate it. I am on the end of my rope. I know, I know sir, I know somebody that, that can help you. I do, and, and, and God bless for, God bless. God bless you. Thank you. I'll talk to you after the, the uh, thing. L listen, I, I want to thank you. I know that Larry has to get going, and Jaime, I, I, don't, I assume the same for you, but I want to thank both of these gentlemen. I, I do want to say one thing, because I kind of want to unite. We're all here for Israel. We all love Israel. And, and how we go about showing that love sometimes is a little different. But one of the things that I have always loved as a lawyer, as a, a pro-Israel lover, um, is I ask questions. When somebody debates me about Israel and says Israel is done, doing this hateful thing, and, and maybe this is to answer your question, sir, uh, to do what Larry and I think Hemi would both agree with, them, <clears throat> challenge them on their own knowledge about Israel. I mean, I think it was Larry who said, <clears throat> what's your perception of the amount of Jews percentage-wise in the world? <clears throat> Excuse me. And the answer was one out of four. How obscene is that? So you're dealing with people that have this impression in their head. You have to bust through their assumptions. And it's not just the population, by the way. When they argue about Israel, ask them, how big do you think Israel is? <laughs> I, I, I do this all the time. It is funny. Right? And I, I offer that. They say they don't know. And I say, well, just take a guess. Like Larry said, take a guess. Choose a state or maybe a couple states of the United States to compare to. They all come, 90% of the time, they come up with this answer Texas. Okay? So I don't correct them. <laughs> and I say, okay, guys, uh, or, tell me what is this, the total size of all the hostile countries around Israel that want Israel destroyed? How big are they? You put them all together. Again, how big? Texas. <laughs> all right? So you're dealing with somebody when they're arguing with you. In their mind's eye, they see Texas versus Texas. And, and going back to population, I, I say, what's the population ratio of the Israelis on the one hand and the, the Arabs that are hostile or the Muslim world that's hostile to Israel? What's the, what's the ratio? I say, is it one to one? Is it 1.1 to one? What? Yeah, it's about one to one. <laughs> and I, then I correct them. Then I correct them. And I asked uh, the one, la one last question. I said, what, in the Middle East, how many democracies are there? And, which, and what are they? And they say, oh, I don't know, about five. It's shocking that the level of ignorance. So say to them, when you're arguing, and each one of us has argued with these people in the past, each one of us, get them to reveal their ignorance. And then the conversation will change. I think all of us can agree to that. All right, Larry, Kemi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming.